Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the history. <laughs> Sakichi Toyota was the inventor, industrialist. He is the father of the Japanese Industrial Revolution, founder of Toyota Loom Works. They made fabric. And the inventor of the automatic power loom. The automatic power loom, when they're actually creating fabric, if the thread would break, the loom would stop. And this was a, a marvel in the industry. And this is the inventor of it. Judoka, right? Judoka. There's a defect, process stops. Machine interprets the broken thread and stops. It's in the DNA of Toyota that I can't build a product and pass it out of station if it, there's a defect. Built into the equipment, all the way back to when he invented the power loom. He developed the 5 Y technique, which is the basis of Toyota's scientific approach, as defined by Taiichi Ono, my hero. That's the automatic loom that he invented in 1926. <clears throat> this is uh, Kichiro Toyota. Notice the D. The, the, the name, actually, of the Toyota family is with a D rather than a T. Do you know why, Dr. Black, they changed it to a T? I guess maybe for marketing? No, they had a, a voting, uh, an audience poll or something like that for that. And oh, they, a, a contest? Yeah. To, yeah. To name it. Founder of the Toyota Group, 1937, implemented chain driven assembly line. This is E.G. Toyota. Notice he died in 2013, he was 100 years old. Uh, president from 67 to 82, credited with initial just in time and Jadoka implementation. And this is the man. This is Henry Ford of Japan. This is the guy responsible for the third generation of manufacturing, Taiichi Ono. And he's not a Toyota, not part of the family. <clears throat> Let that be a lesson to all those who want to practice nepotism. Father of the Toyota production system defined the seven wastes, or muda. Muda is the waste in the system, Japanese term. Refined just-in-time material flow with Kanban inspired by methods used in American supermarkets. There's a lot of people argue whether this really happened, but it's a great story. Uh, Taichi Ono was in an American supermarket and was <coughs> amazed at the fact that someone would grab a gallon of milk and one would slide back in place and somebody would put one behind it. Because in an American supermarket, you actually have pole production, right? Customers take whatever they want, shelves are replenished. No massive inventories. Why is American supermarkets, why were they so smart to set up a pole system prior to Toyota? Any ideas? Yeah, food spoils. Yeah, so it's kind of necessity that you do that. Right? <clears throat> Refine the Jadoka methods, adding Andon. This handsome guy, this is uh, Shigeo Shingo. He was a Toyota industrial engineering consultant working for Taiichi Ono. He developed the single minute exchange of dyes, which really greatly helped them with just in time delivery of material, so that I could change from one product to the, less, to the next within 10 minutes or less where Detroit took hours and hours to make these changes. He refined error-proofing strategies, which is pokey oak or judoka, pokey oak the term for judoka, and station. Well, pokey oak being, I designed the work to where a mistake can't be made. So I use the term necessity as the mother of invention. The unions were supported by the American occupation in Japan, which made it very difficult to lay off employees. At the end of 49, a collapse in sales forced Toyota to terminate a large part of the workforce. After a long strike, Kichiro Toyota resigned, taking responsibility for the failure. The company agreed to the following. Lifetime employment. So it, that's, that's kind of contrary to lean. If you, in your head, the term lean, hey, let's get rid of labor. Let's make this more efficient. Wouldn't matter. You can't get rid of labor, right? They're just redeployed to solve other problems. Use attrition to get rid of labor. You don't lay people off when they're helping you solve problems. Wages steeply tied to seniority rather than job function. Wages tied to company profitability through bonus payments. Um, the company position, Taichi Ono quote, if we're going to take you on for life, you have to do your part by doing jobs that need doing. In other words, Ono thought, I have this burden of a fixed asset, the employees, I need to make the most of what we have here. We need to have more from the employee than just being a cog in the wheel that just completes the work. Employees agree to flexibility and work assignments and to become problem solvers. I think they probably gladly agreed to do that. Contrast this role to mass production employees. Think about compensation. Everybody walks in the door, they all make the same amount of money. They have no say in anything. Flexibility of work assignments, compensation, problem-solving skills, value the company places on them. Think about what you saw in Detroit and compare that to this idea. <clears throat> with the increase of employee cost as wages increased due to seniority, it was believed employees would stay with the company for life. Quitting the company would cause their salaries to reset at low levels. So they didn't really have too much concern that they would lose talented employees that they put a lot of investment in. Ono understood that employees must have their skills consistently improved. As their pay increases, their value must increase. The Japanese domestic market required a wide variety of vehicles. If Toyota were to grow and expand, they would be required to satisfy their own market first. So imagine they're, 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 it's a new company, they're trying to expand and build, but they can't grow to this point unless they satisfy their initial market, which requires a lot of variety of vehicles in that market based upon what the consumer needs. So they can't build a Model T. So they have to be flexible and they have to be competitive to grow. 
E.G. Toyota and Taichi Toyota visited Ford's Rouge plant in the spring of 1950. E.G.'s uncle, Tichiro Ford, uh, visited in 29. Toyota had produced 2,685 vehicles in 13 years, Rouge plant 7,000. E.G. along with Taichi Ono determined Ford's mass production model could not work for Toyota. <coughs> Toyota could not accomplish what Ford did. They're not capable of doing it. It's not that they didn't want to do it. It's not that they had a better idea per se. It's that they couldn't. They couldn't compete that way. So they had to come up with alternative methods. Okay. No guest workers allowed in Japan. Ford utilized a large population of immigrant labor for the Ford facility. So Toyota didn't have that available to them. Immigrants couldn't come to that country and work in their, their uh, company. Uh, foreign investment was prohibited in Japan to protect the development of their industry. So there wasn't the money. There wasn't the infusion of cash or capital to be able to buy thousands of presses. Japan was starved for foreign capital. Purchase of te technology was not possible. Toyota's capital budget could not fund the stamping press methods used by mass producers. The mass production method required hundreds of presses, and the Toyota budget could only afford a few press lines. Now imagine, they, they don't have an entire large operation of presses stamping out the same thing over and over again, and another batch of presses stamping another model out over and over again. They just have a handful of presses. Obviously, they need to change these over rapidly if they're going to get full use out of them. And if they're going to change them over rapidly, they've got to figure out how to do that. Detroit didn't do that, so they have to come up with a method. And that's the SMED we'll talk about later. Western presses were designed to operate at 12 strokes per minute. Toyota's projected annual volume at the time was a few thousand per year. So if you're buying these presses, they're, they're absurdly underutilized and they're way too expensive to be able to accommodate the growth of their industry. If you remember that old uh, GM video, how every six seconds you could see equipment moving. If they only have a few thousand a year, they can't capitalize a facility with equipment systems like that. They have to be very flexible with limited budgets. <coughs> Dies could be changed to utilize the press, but dies weighed tons and required very precise alignment. A slight alignment issue would create defects and could damage dies. So this is even critically more important. If I'm going to change over rapidly, I better have an assurance that I'm doing this well. Detroit employed die change specialists. Changeover could take a day. Some presses were dedicated for the life of the product. So it's time to run the next model. In a day, we'll have the press ready. Toyota couldn't survive that. If you remember earlier, we're talking their initial market that they had to grow in required multitudes of different vehicles, and they only had a handful of presses. So they had to change over rapidly in order to satisfy their market and to build volume. The only solution was to develop die changes every two or three hours versus two or three months. And eventually that became two or three minutes under 10 minutes, single minute exchange of die. And again, Toyota must satisfy their market first. They had a wide variety of vehicles if they were going to grow. Due to production workers being idled by changeover, Taichi Ono decided to deploy the idled workers to perform the die changes. So if I'm shutting the line down, I've got a batch of employees why don't I just utilize them to rapidly change the die? Not possible in mass production. Why could you not do that in mass production? Any ideas? The one guy knows his one job and so he does for years and years and years. Boom. Very good. Yeah. Everybody's, their labor is so specialized. They don't have this variety of knowledge that they can do anything. Not to mention, once they became unionized, they had unionized classifications. Electrician couldn't be a millwright. A millwright couldn't uh, do plumbing. An operator on the line could do no technical work. They were very heavily classified and they're very specialized. So they couldn't just utilize labor that's available to them. Toyota purchased a few used American presses and experimented with the process of rapid die change. <coughs> a quick di change of dies was perfected in the late 80s, time reduced from a day to three minutes. So imagine that, a day to three minutes to change a die. A lot of engineering and a lot of thought and a lot of creativity has to go into being able to do that. And that was, uh, if you recall, Shigeo Shingo was really the guy who really pushed that concept and helped uh, Taichi Ono implement it. Again, single minute exchange of dies, you'll see more of this. There's a lecture on this. We'll talk about what that is. That's critically important. Do you think that all companies in manufacturing are practicing SMED now? No. 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 Did you say no? Yeah. No. Okay. Here, you, you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's amazing. It's really amazing. You go out there in manufacturing and you see they're just pounding out thousands of items of the same type. They're taking forever. They don't, their, their lead time is ridiculous, but they're in an industry where I like to say they can accidentally make money. They're probably competing with other competitors that are practicing the same old practices they are. And it's prevalent. It's not that it's unusual. It's, it's not typical that you have lean shots. Primarily only in automotive. <clears throat> An unexpected outcome was less expensive per part than mass production. Now, they say unexpected, right? So it, you can understand why unexpected. Because they said, we need these presses. We need to change them over rapidly. That's the only way we can compete. So their, their motive was to try to change these presses over rapidly so we can build all of our models because we only have a handful of presses. But the result of it was it was much less expensive to build the product, which they really weren't driving for that. They are just driving to try to develop an industry. And so that was as a result of work in process inventory being reduced. Because if I'm not, if I'm not stamping parts out JIT just in tons, it's my joke, by the way, that means just in time. If I'm not stamping parts just in tons, 
I'm stamping parts out just in time. I'm producing only what the next process needs when it needs it. Now there could be overproduction a little bit there because you have to manage some of these things, but that's the ideal. So by reducing that whip inventory, they reduce the time it takes for an order to delivery to the customer. They reduce all the waste in the system. They reduce defects significantly because there weren't warehouses full of parts that could be defective. Remember Judoka? That's a term of building quality and station, not passing a defect forward. So SMED really fed into both of these. Indirectly with Judoka, directly with just in time. A skilled, motivated workforce was required to do these things. At the time of the study, Toyota used very little offline repair. Mass production used 20 to 25% of labor, labor to repair cars offline. I saw this. That's true. An awful lot of offline repairmen. Car goes through the entire process where all the value is added, rolls off the line, it's ready to ship to the customer, and 25% of your assembly workforce is fixing it. You see the waste re related to this? It's unbelievable. Why? Because they don't build quality in station. Because they don't have Jadoka. They had to push the metal. I, I know back in... 80s, you, it's a frightening thing to hit line stop. It's going to draw a lot of attention. So they weren't really encouraged to stop and fix. And really, there wasn't a, a large effort to design the work and the product so it can't fail. Because we have, to, we have a lot of people offline that can repair. <clears throat> and then Ono and on cords. Stop the line and solve the problems as they occurred. So in, in my opinion, Ono put the and on cords on the assembly line because they weren't able to come up with a strategy to have the machine, like the uh, loom, thread breaks, loom shuts down. They did a lot of things with equipment. The equipment could sense the failure, line shut down. Where they couldn't, how about let's just give a cord to the person doing the work. If they see it, pull the cord, stop the line. So it's kind of an extension of the equipment being able to perceive the defect. Kind of a weak, in my opinion. It's good, but it's a little bit weaker because that assumes people see defects. So you have to then design the works to where the defect is obvious so you can stop the line. Because the primary problem in manufacturing is you don't know. You don't know you have a defect, even if you're allowed to stop. So when you go down and you build Lego cars on your first run, that'll be very, very clear to you that you don't know you're producing defects. And then they use the 5Y method of, re of resolution to solve problems. They use their workforce to use the 5Y. People familiar with 5Y? It's just simply asking why five times and then checking that your responses make logical sense. And there's some level of training, but it's relatively simplistic. Uh, what, how does that compare to Six Sigma? Six Sigma is a barrier to most of your workforce that can't use it. Right. 5Y is something that everyone on the line can use. Right? So if Toyota wants to push a problem-solving system, doesn't it make sense if they use their entire workforce to solve problems that they use something with the simplicity that everybody can use? And I like to think that Ono was so obsessively compulsive about standards, standardization of everything, that I think he uses this 5Y, the power of it's not the method necessarily. It's more that it standardizes the thinking process of problem-solving for everyone in the organization. So he standardized people's minds. They must all think methodically in the same way through problems. He has, he's reduced variation in the way people attack problems by using 5Y. And to me, that's the power of it. Line stops were excessive in the beginning. Toyota could not survive unless problems were permanently resolved. This is a Bob term. <laughs> I just throw it up there because I love the guy, even though he beat me to a pulp. Bob, Bob would say, what is your irreversible corrective action? And he wanted to be emphatic that I don't want to hear that you're going to adjust the work instruction. I want to know what you're going to do to redesign process to where it can happen. And of course, we couldn't always do that. Again, that was the expectation. Proper use of the 5Y methodology was critical to success. Workforce skill and motivation are absolutely required. You must have an inspired, motivated workforce. Has anybody worked in manufacturing in here? Is the workforce typically pretty inspired and motivated where you've been? No. <laughs> A lot of places, no. Right? Is it because they just randomly hired the wrong people? Something else is wrong, right? The system is what's wrong. And the way you lead the organization, the way you integrate people into the process, that's what's wrong. I like to say most people just get turned off. Doesn't take long. Boom. Done. Not going to get anything out of them. They've had enough. They know you don't care anyway. Remember I've made a point about a common thing in mass production is employees withhold information. No, they don't. They just know that no one's interested in the information, so they quit talking. <clears throat> so this inspired people is critically important if Toyota's going to be successful in solving problems. Okay, the supply base. So here's the OEM assembly plant. Here's the supply base. Obviously, if that's not impacted, we're going to have minimal success with this system. So Toyota became partners with a supply base. Mass pits suppliers against each other, and they continually shot price. If you remember my Deming quote, I was at the Deming lecture, because I'm that old, and Deming, Deming asked the purchasing guy, what do you do? He didn't know he was a purchasing guy unless he planted them. I don't know. It was just too perfect. The guy said, I work at pur in purchasing for GM. And, and Deming said to him, oh, uh, you know, maybe my grandson can get a job with you because he knows the difference between a high and a low number. That was his point. You don't think. You don't care about the process. You're not concerned with how well you develop your product. 
You don't care how it integrates into the manufacturing process. You care whether it's a dime instead of 15 cents. That's all you care about. And that's how mass operates. That's not how Toyota operates. Mass system created a disincentive or inability to improve cost and quality as design and manufacturing issues were not shared with the supply base. Cost advantage by one could eliminate the competitor. Ideas and innovations were secrets because they're all looking out for themselves. They're trying to put each other out of business. The suppliers, they're trying to survive. And if they didn't do that, they wouldn't survive because low cost would win. Ford and GM designed most of the 10,000 parts required to build a car. They would then ask suppliers to bid quality, defective parts per thousand, end price. So just a handful of smart people at GM came up with the design. How do you think that works? The entire supply base with all their expertise had no say in that. They just shopped, they just quoted a price. What's that do for the quality of design? Or even the cost of the product being produced. They can't be innovative in how they produce it in terms of cost and quality. So you've cut off, I don't know, 80, 90% of the entire process of making a car from thinking, and you put it in the hands of only at the top. Toyota suppliers organized in tiers. First tier suppliers worked with Toyota on design. So they had a part to play in designing the product itself. Toyota asked them to work on a design that functioned with other systems. We don't care what you do. Here's what we need it to do. Work on it. We'll give you all the information you need to develop the best product you can come up with, with the highest quality and the lowest cost. You have full discretion to develop it. They also encouraged to learn from each other. First tier suppliers did not compete. Boy, that's big. So now they can talk to each other. Now they can work together. Hey, what, that design you're making on the brake system, can you talk to us about that? Because we're trying to design the lines that feed it. And we want, maybe there's a coupling between the two systems that we can agree to that's going to save us both money. We've got an idea on how to do that. And it actually is better, more robust. Can't happen in Detroit. Second tier supplier were specialists. They were grouped in associations that were also not competitive with each other and encouraged to share information. You see how this, the construction of this entire system goes beyond the assembly plant and it goes out to the supply base and it encouraged creativity of all aspects of the business, of the enterprise. People thinking, people solving problems. It goes back to Ono's comment, I think it's Ono, we don't come here to make cars, we come here to think. Toyota holds an equity stake in their tier one suppliers. They share information and help their supply base improve operations. So they're truly partners with the supplier. Many of Toyota top managers not in line for senior positions are given top leadership roles in tier one suppliers. They're putting their own people, well-trained, well-developed in supplier locations to teach, to teach them how to manage these systems and improve. Ono then incorporated Kanban material movement through the entire value stream. So if you have the assembly plant here, all the material that moves within that plant, that's important. Just in time and quality, Jadoka, how about the rest? If we start working through that whole supply base and we create just in time flow of material on every link all the way to the bottom, boy, we've got something powerful that might be able to put the arsenal of democracy out of business. Didn't really intend on it, we just wanted to compete. But we've, we've come up with something that is incredible. We have come up with a third generation of manufacturing. Internal engineering management. I use this one, division of labor for engineers. The door lock engineer example of what I'm going to talk about. We, I had a door line when I was in Sterling Heights Assembly, and there's this great guy. He's the, he's the engineer, resident engineer for door systems. But he honestly, I don't think he could have designed anything on the door. His job was to interface with the supplier and make sure they weren't screwing up. So he became almost a bureaucrat and an administrator. He was not a design engineer. The suppliers designed the product. They quoted the price. They said, here's what we're going to give you. He made sure they met their quality requirement. If something didn't work out, he would be hammering the supplier because they had issue. Yes? Um, I have a question in regards to... Uh I'm sure you've heard of the airbag problems yeah. that went on in Toyota and Honda. Takata. Right. Um, how does that fit in? Because I know they were supplier and currently they're not able to supply enough uh, airbags to fix all of the defects. They Why would you ask me a question like that that I can't even begin to answer? No. <laughs> so, so, well, they're having major, major problems with this. Uh -huh. I mean, you know Sean Gallagher? Sean Gallagher, I think he's had a car now for two or three months, a loner, because his car has one of those airbags. Right, I could purchase there, one earlier. Yeah, he, he, it's not fixed yet. So you can imagine the response to this problem as large as it is. They're not capable. They're not capable of fulfilling the demand. Nobody... Nobody thought they were going to have to go back five years and build airbags in one month. You know, so they've got a major issue with this. So what went wrong there, PFEMA or DFEMA? You familiar with PFEMA or DFEMA? No, sir. Uh, failure mode effects analysis. It's a DFEMA problem. The design didn't take into consideration the potential for failure. It wasn't a process issue in the assembly. It's an issue in the design. Both design and process must be thoroughly analyzed using PFEMA or DFEMA for risk. Somebody missed it. I can't remember. I think there could have been potential criminal problems with that where there were emails about it, but I, I don't quite recall. Now and then, this happens. You know, GM, the key falling out of ignition. And before you guys were old enough to even hear it, maybe not born, the Firestone tire problem nearly put Ford out of business because people were getting killed because the tire wouldn't hold up. So when people start dying and they discover it, 10 or 15 people have died and it becomes an issue, 
that's <laughs> devastating to these companies, but it's always possible that it can happen. There's a question? Oh, I didn't answer your question, did I? Fair enough, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Lean created multidiscipline teams which encompassed all areas, including process. Strong leaders, regardless of discipline, were promoted. In other words, they might even let me manage an engineering team, and I'm not an engineer at Toyota, because they say, you know, Tom has the right characteristics to make sure things happen. Eh, we don't care whether he can engineer it or not. There's a lot of engineers on the team. Let's have him run that team. They would do that. Uh, I think that's why I love them so much. They respect me. <laughs> I have something to offer. Toyota production systems matured. After 20 years of attempting to implement their ideas throughout Toyota and the supply base, Toyota achieved their goal. They're a legitimate company. They put their system in place. They could compete. Toyota's flexibility allowed them to build multiple models per plant. That's a, that's a huge issue because this, this is really getting to the flexibility, which is a key in Toyota. I can build anything you want next cycle on the machine. Well, that's ideal. Remember, that's being like God. But they're so close to that, and mass is so far from that. That flexibility is great. If I can build multiple models in an assembly plant, you think that gives me a competitive advantage over Ford GM that can only build one model in an assembly plant? Huge advantage. Toyota's lean product development introduced a new vehicle to market in half the time of traditional mass production firms, doubling the product offering with the same development budget. Huge. That might just put the arsenal of democracy out of business. That is huge. <clears throat> Toyota transplants were building two to three vehicles versus one assembly plant at GM and Ford. Toyota was now poised to capture market share. Yes. Yes, Sensei. <laughs> yeah, maybe in pre-84, I toured the Honda in Marysville, Ohio, where they were building two different versions of the Honda, the Ford and the Civic, on the same line. They were coming down, there'd be six, eight, ten Civics, different body styles, and the same thing with the Accords. And, um, I got to the place where they, they had to switch over the, one of the welding stations and they had two big boxes, uh, frames that had welding arms on it. So one box would slide out in the, for the Accord, and the other box would slide in for the Civic. Then six or eight Civics would go through that box and get welded, and then the other box, it would slide out. So that was really my first time to see mixed model final assembly lines and, and the priests going into it. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. And you think about the investment in the, that system. Yeah. It's a lot of money to set that system up, yeah. right? But it dwarfs the savings that you gain from flexibility. Yeah. The savings that the company gains from being flexible is a multitude of times greater than the large investment to set these systems up to be flexible. So when you hear about SMED and changeover, there's cost associated with it, but it's nothing in comparison to the flexibility you create through your whole system. Yeah. Six months later, I toured Ford Mustang and was told by the engineer that was giving me the tour that that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> I swear I saw a flying saucer. As cars became too complex for the average owner to repair, reliability became much more important to the customer. Toyota's use of workforce to stop, align, and on root cause the problems and permanently solve them led to unprecedented quality. And I saw this back in the 80s. You know, there, there were, I lived in Detroit area, right? And there were these traders in the population and they just started buying Toyotas. So, hey, we build, we build American cars here and they were buying Toyotas and they couldn't resist. They couldn't resist because these cars were obviously, obviously better cars. And once that became pretty well known, you're in serious trouble because you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose market share rapidly. And there's no question. I think you, you bought your first Toyota, didn't you, Jay? I bought a uh, Land Cruiser uh, to get around in the snow in Vermont, and then I traded that in for a Toyota Celica. That was in 70, 71, 72. Uh, the Celica was one of the first ones off the boat. And uh, yes. In uh, this point about repair, back in the 60s, any of us could fix a car. Yeah. Uh, you could go in, take the starter off, put another starter. Even I could fix a car, Ali. Like, they were easy to fix. I mean, it was simple. You know, you had backyard mechanics fixing cars. So they could buy a car, it could be a piece of junk, they could fix it, no problem. But when you started, had advancements in spark control computers, when the under dad, you pick the hood up and there, there's no room to even put a wrench, your ability to fix cars kind of started to go away. So you need one that you don't have to worry about. Toyota worked out a system of build to order with its dealer network. They worked closely with dealers whom they either wholly owned or had equity stake in scheduling orders to smooth production at the assembly plants. This greatly helped to accomplish the principle of making only what the downstream process requests from the smallest supplier to the final customer. So you had a leveled schedule. So when you look at an assembly plant, you see they're building 1,000 cars a day. And for the next year, every day, they're building 1,000 cars. Do you think that's how demand works? It's that perfect? No. So they manage it. They manage it in a number of ways. They have agreement with their dealers to keep it at 1,000. Companies offer incentives to sell more cars to keep it at 1,000. They take line shutdowns for a month to keep it at 1,000 because it's critically important that they don't affect the speed of the line. So they have to level that schedule. Then they can construct a system of just-in-time flow and flexibility. 
Okay, a couple of quotes here, and they're very similar. Womack is the author of The Machine That Changed the World, but these two quotes are very similar. Taichi Ono, all we are doing is looking at the timeline from the moment the customer gives us an order to the point that we collect cash. He's very direct. And we're reducing that timeline by reducing non-value added waste. Non-value added waste primarily in this case is massive, massive inventories, which take forever for a car to flow through the entire process. If you're going first in, first out through the inventory piles, it's amazing how long that car actually takes to get out from the entire supply base. So he's saying, completely eliminate inventory, then the time from order to delivery is the cycle time of the system added up, theoretically. So that's what he's trying to do. No <coughs> defects, no inventory, ideally, ideally. <laughs> and then Womack, I think he wanted to be pretty smart about this too, so he said something very similar, but obviously uniquely to him. All we are really trying to do in lean manufacturing, this is good, this is important, because he's summarizing everything here. All we are really trying to do is get one process to make only what the next process needs when it needs it. No batching, right? I don't build stuff people aren't using and pile it up. We are, link, we are trying to link all processes from final consumer back to raw material in a smooth flow without detours that generate the shortest lead time, highest quality, lowest cost. And we'll get into that. After we get through this boring history, we'll start talking about these systems. Right. So this, I just threw a few books up here. There's about 10,000 more on the subject, but the point is this is very common discipline in the world. You might not know that in your industrial engineering program, <clears throat> but the whole automotive world reads tons of lean literature. They're all fairly well versed, and, and these are all pretty high selling books on the discipline of lean. So if you're going into industry, you got to know these things.